we always ask ourselves, you know, who should we be bringing together and who must we bring together? And we know we have to bring together the grassroots. The grassroots is where farmers, where Farm Aid has put its effort and it's where we will continue to put our effort and it's we believe that that's where the strength is going to come along with a big handshake with all the eaters in this country. So that's a pretty tall assignment, but that's what we all have to do. So be sure you read the lowdown because 
he really will tell you who we all we need to be connecting with all the time. Thank you, and Jim Hightower. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Muir and uh, also uh, Alicia Harvey, the terrific work that they've done to pull this event together. We appreciate And we've got all this uh, blue ribbon livestock up here. Uh, we're very proud of it. We've got the, down at the end here, Ralph Page uh, is uh, with us. And there's uh, Paul Sobosinski. And we've got uh, uh, Roger Allison with us, Helen Waller next, and David Center, Mark Ritchie, of course, and then our lady uh, leader, uh, Carolyn Newell. Uh, well, here we are. Farm Aid 2015, but we're going to go back to Farm Aid 1985, and then we're really going to go back a decade at least uh, before that. Uh, the question here is, where the hell did this come from, Farm Aid? We know it's a very old big concert, but why? Uh, who did it? What was the purpose? So that's what these seven people are gathered up here to visit with us about, uh, people who were there. The Maddis Hellers and the Agitators and the Mavericks who came together in that movement really prior to Farm Aid in the 1970s uh, to put it together. We're going to hear their stories because their stories uh, advise us about the future. Uh, this is sort of the GPS of the movement up here. <laughs> if we know where they've been, then we might know uh, where we're going. Uh, I'm going to set a little bit of a provide a little bit of context for that uh, and set the stage a little bit, going back to the 1970s. That was a period uh, that was an all-out assault on the family farm uh, in this country. They were transforming agriculture into agribusiness, food to be just another manufactured commodity like widgets. Indeed, tomatoes were manufactured. The University of California Davis made that hard green tomatoes so it could withstand the mechanical harvesting machine. They adopted the tomato to the machinery. That was the attitude of the time, and that attitude then transferred to the fact that they said we need no farmers, really. Bankers and corporate CEOs and engineers to take care of our food for us. These were people who could not run a watermelon stand if we gave them the melons and had the highway patrol flag down the customer's farm. <laughs> but they were in charge of remaking agriculture. And the chief executioner, of course, was Earl Butts, uh, then out of, the, out of Purdue, the Land Grant College over in Indiana, just next door to where we sit today. And Earl was a very good executioner. He told the farmers at the time, said, get big or get out. Resist and perish. Secretary of Agriculture. He said, uh, and he, by the way, uh, did his part to make sure that happened. Uh, at the time that I got involved in, in this uh, uh, big struggle that was evolving out in the countryside, we were losing about a thousand family farmers a week, every week, a thousand of them uh, departing off the land. But Earl had a rationale for that. He said, it is good that we've been able to produce an increasing amount of food with the work of a smaller percentage of our population. This releases people to do something useful in our society. I, I hear Earl say that, and I think, 100,000 sperm and you were the fastest? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, farmers were naturally shocked by this, uh, that their own Secretary of Agriculture, their own United States government, many state governments, and the Congress would turn their backs on this fabulous institution that had indeed built America. They blamed themselves largely, because after all, granddaddy had survived the Depression, daddy had survived the 1950s drought, and then here they were going to lose the farm. So it turned inward for a while. But then they got their attitude back. They rebelled, and rebelled with humor. I remember when I made an early trip out to Iowa to own, with the American Ag Movement out there, and a farmer said to me, do you know the difference between a pigeon uh, and a farmer? I said, no, and he said, well, a pigeon can still make a deposit on a John Deere. So, and that was the situation at the time. We'd been wiped out. 
The farm crisis was a rural crisis, was a personal crisis, but fundamentally it was a moral crisis, a failure of our national leadership. But then farmers began to come together to organize and to mobilize. And we first saw the tangible sign of this when the tractor cades hit the cities. Mile after mile of tractors coming down the highway, going into cities, blocking traffic to raise this issue to the larger public attention. So with that, we're going to turn to some folks who were there at the time. I'll start with uh, David Center, uh, because he was an organizer of tractor cades uh, back in the 1970s. Later became the national director of American Agriculture Movement, continues to work particularly on legislation uh, for our movement across the board. David, uh, you were organizing those tractor cades. What did you have in mind at the time?
go now to uh, Roger Allison out of Missouri. He's the executive director of the Missouri Rural Crisis Center, founder of that organization. Uh, been taking on the corporate powers uh, in agriculture for a long, long uh, time, uh, both uh, assailing them but also creating alternatives uh, to them. Uh, Roger, uh, you got involved uh, as an activist uh, the old-fashioned way. They, they were foreclosing on your farm. Is that it? You bet. Uh, I could hear all right out there. Okay. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, Thank mm -hmm. you. 
that, that train ride pretty well tells the story, I think, of the people coming together uh, around a big issue. Uh, and without the money to travel in the cells, they showed up at the tracks, uh, at least. And most alive, as Woody Allen says, is showing up. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a big help, a big encouragement. Now we're going to turn to Helen. Uh, she's, uh, she's done what the movement has always had to do, uh, which is to make personal sacrifice to stand forward uh, and help rally. Uh, a movement. Uh, she was a founder of the National Family Farm uh, Coalition, uh, and she's continued the, uh, her activism, uh, not only on farm issues, but across the board. Uh, she was a, a candidate for a lieutenant governor up in uh, Montana, and uh, I'm sure they're sorry that they didn't get you, Helen, uh, by now. Uh, and she was a Jesse Jackson delegate to the 1980 National Democratic Convention uh, in Atlanta. Helen, you, you had to make a big sacrifice. You, you were a farmer, but you left, you left the farm, and you didn't particularly want to do that. that that's correct. I, I uh, uh, am a farmer, and that was all I ever wanted to do. I uh, married with, uh, my husband, who I had known since we were in the fourth grade, and we, uh, he went to the service, and as soon as he got home, we went to the farm, uh, his parents' farm, and eventually had land of our own, and uh, we raised my children on the farm. Um, I um, wasn't born into a family of hellraisers, but I'll tell you, I will admit to being an outstanding, outspoken advocate for the family farm system of production agriculture. Uh, when our children were small, I learned one day in the 70s that Eastern Montana had been targeted for massive coal strip mining. Our area was described as the boiler room for the nation, a sacrifice area. And I said, Gordy, you know, we can't do that. And so we organized farmers and ranchers in our local county. And then we joined together with others, uh, rural and urban folks, and uh, joined the Northern Plains Resource Council, and later with Wyoming, Colorado, North and South Dakota, Idaho, and Oregon, we became the Western Organization of Resource Councils. Our network has grown and grown. While the coal strip mining projects were being advanced, we made every effort to ensure that the negative environmental, social, and economic impacts of development were considered. I won't go into any details, but I want you to know there is mine in my backyard. <laughs> By the time the energy crisis was winding down, the farm crisis was hitting rural America. Northern Plains was organized to protect our farms and ranches from the ravages of coal mining. But I remember at an annual meeting of the Northern Plains when I emphatically stated that it did us little good to save our farms from the drag line and lose them to the banker. So we continued to address the coal problem, but we were also faced with a financial crisis on our farms and ranches. In the fall of 84, Merle Hansen of the North America Farm Alliance called a meeting in Madrid, Iowa to discuss our plight. One of about 100 farmers from Minnesota to Texas, from Kentucky to Montana, who concluded that misguided government policy of the economic problem causing widespread foreclosures, which obviously was a result of low market prices and that farmers needed to write their own farm bill. The following year, it was Willie Nelson, Neil Young, John Mellencamp, and their performing friends who gave heart to the efforts and helped to financially support the organizations that were fighting for the survival of our food producers. 
We knew we needed a better organizational structure, so February of 86 found us back in Iowa to formalize the structure of member organizations from around the country in the National Save the Family Farm Coalition, and I served as its first president. Then we had the Farmer Rancher Congress. It was held and it gave us further direction. Soon afterwards, a committee was formed to actually write a farm bill with the help of Texas Commissioner of Agriculture, Jim Hightower, and Jim Nichols, who was Agriculture Commissioner of Minnesota. The Farm Policy Reform Act was written by that committee. It was later revised and introduced as the Family Farm Act by Senator Harkin and Congressman Gebhardt. Corporate agribusiness ultimately killed our bill, but it forced debate of concepts that are as valid today as they were uh, then. Our biggest success was the passage of the Farm Credit Reform Act of 87. It was only through citizens' organizations and participation that our voices were, were heard. Um, what started as the 80s farm movement has expanded to include now uh, people who are concerned about the food they eat. There's farmers markets that are thriving. And, and as processed food becomes more adulterated, there is urgency and opportunity for the feeders and the eaters of this nation to join forces with unrelenting power the power to change farm and food policy to serve hungry people instead of giant agribusiness corporations. Let's go for it. That's terrific. Well, let's see, we've been to Texas, we've been to Missouri, we've been out to Montana, let's go to the Southland now. We'll go all the way down to Alabama. And a man who has been fighting for justice uh, down in that country uh, for a long, uh, long time. Founder of the Federation of Southern Co-ops and the Land Assistance Fund uh, before that. The winner of all kinds of awards from the United Nations, Martin Luther King Jr. He's in the Cooperative Hall of Fame, Ralph Page. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Let me, first of all, I have to say thank you to Willie, Neal, Dave Mathis, uh, Carolyn Mugard, and the whole gang. Without Farm Aid, believe me, folks, I don't believe we would have any farm family farmers left today. That includes black farmers and all farmers. There's not been another voice like this for us. I believe that Farm Aid built the greatest advocate Infra infrastructure that we've seen bring together farmers, farm leaders, and advocates for the first time in, in 1985. No one else had brought it together. I was green as grass at that time. If I'd have put me in the field, the cows would have ate me up. But it is a time when we needed a voice. It gave a voice to the voiceless, gave us hope, gave us opportunity to voice it. There are so many things that I can remember over the 30 years that, uh, that Farm Aid did to, to, to help family farmers survive. In particular, one of them was the Farm Congress. That it was bringing together uh, the most diverse group of farmers, including African American women, Hispanics, Native Americans. That's what it's about. We did not have a voice, did not have a group or place to go to, to voice those things. This was at a time when black farmers was losing land at two and a half times the rate of white farmers, almost losing 15 million acres of land and running off a thousand poor black folk from the land. It was important that we join this network and I joined it to the first one there, representing the Federation, and damn near been to all of them except one. That's the time I had a heart attack. <laughs> and my wife had left me, I got up and went to that. 
but I, and then, you know, there are some memory things, very me things that really heavy on my heart today because fun this is the 10th anniversary year of Katrina, I believe. We were there from A came to the assistance of with the Federation of the Organization. They came there to put and started the first first market there with B and Burkett and not forget the other folk in the lower ninth ward to say we are back. Funded it and helped us bring in vegetables to do that with the Federation and other groups. Farm Aid set up in Alabama the shelter, that's two more hours, thank you, uh, set up a shelter. There, again, uh, FEMA didn't want us to do it, we opened it anyway. John Zippert, other people, we opened the shelter, and guess who brought food there by the truckload and who helped sponsor it? Roger from Patchwork had it. We brought down two trailer, two trailer loads of ham and, uh, and just everything we can mention. Doing, making those things happen. From it, and finance and policy, working with policy, with organizations. I, I hate to start naming people in places, but with organizations that knew how to do it. See, part of this whole networking, this infrastructure thing I'm talking about, is talking about bringing folk together and giving power to the powerless. That's what Farm Aid has been. That's what it's continued to do. I can remember uh, uh, an hour ago. I can remember when uh, Willie was asked five years in, how, will that be a next one? Or how long will this go on? Willie looked at the reporter sitting in the audience as long as it take. And damn it, he's still here with the gang doing it. Give him a hand. They, it, it, I mean, this is what this country needs. That kind of stupidness, that kind of commitment, that kind of tenacity to fight it. It hadn't been a single farm crisis. It's been a crisis for 30 years. And the bastards are still at us, if you want to know the truth. And they will continue to be at us if we don't have someone to fight. My hat's off to it, and there are so many, many things. I wish we could have another Congress. I would, you know, the drought. I picked this shirt up today because the heat lift. South Carolina, I believe, we had been abundant, the other folk from South Carolina. We were up there, we started a hay lift. I start over there, zero. There's a hay lift. Uh, it started there, we made to bring hay to the south during the drought and vice versa. That went on for every one of them. And this was important to me that I would wear this shirt, although it's two si three, five sizes too small. It, it is. <laughs> But really, those are the kinds of things. We had some folk, and I have to say this with Shirley Sherrod, that was so embarrassed when we brought a train load of stuff there. And this was uh, family farmers that was, didn't look like us, but too embarrassed, so we let them have the hay in the evening because they didn't want to see them taking the hay off the truck, <laughs> off the train. But we had, I mean, it, it was an, it's been an amazing trip for me to be a part of this community, this group of advocates and organization. It's an education, it's an experience that I would have personally never had in a character organization that I worked with to new places, new heights, and got us to do things we would have never done without that support. This, I thank you, Farm Aid, I thank you, Carolyn, I think you and America should be so indebted to the greatest organization in the world. It should give Farm Aid the same kind of money it gave to this other organization got caught with millions of dollars not doing what they're supposed to do last week. Now Farm Aid would never do that because it has done what it's supposed to do and continue. Thank you very much. A movement uh, is not just a bunch of uh, committee meetings uh, and uh, policies and, uh, and et cetera, but as uh, Ralph did such a good job there uh, pointing out that uh, a movement is, is family, uh, being there and being there for the long haul. Uh, uh, 
Well, they also once told me, he said, hi, Terry, you know, the early bird might get the worm, but it's a second mouse that gets the cheese. So you gotta persevere. <laughs> Hang in there and keep it going. Well, now well, let's hop on up uh, to uh, Minnesota. Uh, Paul Sofosinski uh, is a terrific uh, guy up there, has gotten involved in the early 80s uh, in this uh, rebellion uh, in the countryside. Uh, and has continued that work uh, for the long haul and was involved in this historical connection from the 30s to uh, the 80s and now today uh, through the penny auctions and that sort of thing. Paul, uh, you founded uh, Minnesota Groundswell. What was that about? Oh, thank you. Um, I am Paul Sobosinski. I'm a farmer from Wabasso, Minnesota, and I'm a crop and livestock farmer yet. And currently I work with an organization called the Land Stewardship Project. Um, and incidentally, uh, at the time I started working and was part of formulating Minnesota Groundswell, I really wasn't aware of the Land Stewardship Project, but simultaneously, while our organization was working to stop foreclosures and raise hell, Land Stewardship Project was fighting insurance companies that were foreclosing on farms and then taking those farms back and ripping out the conservation. So. My experience in terms of organizing, and part of the reason I'm wearing this here, is that the most important piece in organizing is first to stand up together with your neighbors. That's the most important piece, and that's what we would do at foreclosure sales. Uh, when we finally organized a rally at the Capitol in St. Paul, to that rally, we brought over 17,000 people on January 27th of 1985 and it was cold, very cold. <laughs> but we bought people there, and that just didn't happen overnight. You know, some people think, oh, oh people just on and bang, it'll go. But really started with organizing that started back in 1984, and, 80, and early 85. And what we did back in 84 and also 83, we started to bring farmers together and have a discussion about what we could do. We brought together members of Farmers Union, NFO, American Ag folks. And we, one of the first things we did, we organized a tractor cade at Clarkfield, Minnesota. Luann, remember that? Your husband Wayne was there. Uh, and then we also did one in Wilmer, Minnesota. And we did farm meetings in Wabasa, my hometown, in Worthington, Minnesota. And then finally we organized out of that whole group of people we brought them down to the Minneapolis Convention Center. One of the farmers, Larry Green, uh, paid for the use of the center. And from there, we hit upon the idea of doing a rally at the Capitol in St. Paul. And we came back to St. Paul on January 27 with 17,000 people and raised hell. And Governor Perpich was the governor at that point, And we were asking for a moratorium on foreclosure. And we kind of knew that he probably just wouldn't do it just like that. And so we announced that we had the governor speak, that we wanted him to do that, and we were gonna start it off with having a foreclosure rally for Jim Langman of the American Ag Movement in Minnesota. And so at Glenwood, Minnesota, we gathered farmers there, and they all had a number of people surrounding the sheriff wearing these armbands. And one of the key pieces we always emphasized at every foreclosure sale we were at, stand together with farmers and stand in non, with nonviolence, but with a clear voice. And we surrounded the sheriff and kept away the banker that was going to bid there that today from bidding, and that sale was shut down that day. So that piece about organizing is the most important piece to remember that. And part of the idea was kind of interesting. You learn need to do now because we are back with three and a half dollar corn and we are back with prices that don't work but people need to stand together now going into the future people working together and so as I uh, you know for example back then a uh, banker from Robert Falls uh, remember his name Doug Boltman came up to me and says he handed me the farm book and said you guys need to do this because he knew something was wrong. And that's what we emphasized. Uh, and we came together and we came back again in, at the state capitol in uh, 1986 for the decade. Organized with American Ag folks. And we pushed every at the level. 
we didn't get the moratorium, what we got was mediation. A piece called right of first refusal. That meant that if your farm was foreclosed upon, the farmer had the first right to buy that farm back. We got uh, funding for the Farm Advocate Program, push for funding for the Farm Legal Action Group. We got interest buy down. Basically, we got people that stood up. And if, if we're gonna work, look at this crisis that's now upon us now, in whatever area we're working, it's still it, always most important is that people stand up and be together. And I, that I got. We a program called Source of Hope. Remember it, Terry? And, and while it seemed like kind of crazy, you know, to go out and plant when you were in trouble, but you had to have that, that sense of hope. And so that's extremely important. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now let's go to that uh, farm section uh, up in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, uh, for uh, Carolyn Mugar, uh, who's been the director of Farm Aid for 30 years. She was just 10 when she started. <laughs> to point out. And at the time had been uh, uh, an organizer with OCAW, Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers Union. Uh, uh, she and her husband, John O'Connor, and Tony Mazaki and other great people uh, doing that kind of organizing, which applied directly uh, to this kind of organizing. Carolyn Mugar. You know what I would like to say? I would like to say I want to hear more from everybody else because really um, Farm Aid is, part, it, we work in partnership with people and we are only as good as the grassroots is and that's what we, that's what we believe in, that's what we're going to continue to support and we're going to continue to support people working with each other. So for me to hear everybody today, it's absolutely moving to me to hear about all these struggles and these struggles are going on and our work will be to, to support that. So that's what I want to say. Well, let, let me, I've got to ask you one question. Why is Farm Aid headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts? <laughs> well, you know, Willie, if you have ever read any questions that have been asked to Willie and the answer is, you know, he gives answers that are hysterically funny, but one of the answers I've given to that is that it's sort of a Zen, a zen experience. Um, it was one of those things that just happened. I was a friend of a friend of Bill Whitliff, who was a friend of Willie's, who uh, directed um, the movie Country that Sarah Vogel has had so much to do with, and you'll hear about it tonight later. The movie Country is being shown, with, and I hope everybody can come. So I was asked to do it. Um, I knew really nothing about what was going on in farm country, but I just kind of hit the road. You know, around the first Farm Aid concert, I was talking to Willie Nelson, and he said, we're gonna open an office in Cambridge. And I'm thinking, and I says, I thought I knew every town in Texas. Where the hell is Cambridge? <laughs> and he said, no, 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 like in Boston. And I said, well, what in the hell are we opening an office in Cambridge for? And he said, wait till you meet Carolyn Mugar. He right. was exactly right. <laughs> Actually, uh, Bill Whitliff I know as well, and he told me that uh, Will and them raised seven million dollars in that first concert, uh, and and uh, Bill went up to uh, Willie and said, "You need to find somebody who will not steal the money." <laughs> 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 and Carolyn didn't. So, now, now let's go to to sum us all up here and uh, bring it home. Uh, we'll go back to. Uh, Minnesota guy I've known uh, for 150 years, uh, been a terrific uh, fighter for 
agriculture uh, up there, farmers, uh, farm workers, uh, workers generally, the people, uh, and uh, did such a good job there that uh, much to the amusement of the people of Minnesota, got himself elected uh, to Secretary of State uh, up there and did just a stupendous job and came out with his virtue intact. That's pretty rare in state government. Uh, but uh, Mark has been a fighter forever and including going back to the early organizing days of this movement, Mark Ritchie. Thank you. Andy. What I know when I look back over this period, and I think about the work of Farm Aid, but I think about the work of all of us and those who aren't here with us today, I think about two things that we've done. We've done. We've kept that hope alive to last 30 years with the energy to go on. So how do you get up every morning? How do you keep going when the, the bad things happen on your farm, in your family? But the second thing that's happened is we built a movement that was a movement based on peace. This emotion that you've seen here is a little tiny bit. Those 17,000 people who came out in 20 degree blow weather were furious. The anger, the loss, the grief, all of those emotions. Yes, there were moments and there were places where there was violence that occurred, but this was a peaceful and a loving movement and it did not just happen that way. It happened that way because people got conscious. And I want to say two things about this keeping hope alive and about keeping this movement peaceful because it came from this group of people and some special things that Farm Aid brought. We got to gather on occasion. Some of those occasions were funerals. Some of those occasions were weddings. Some of those occasions were kind of special events in the lives of people. Some of those occasions, like Farm Aid, were for celebrating. But those times of gathering, when our hearts were broken, torn out of us, and when at Farm Aid we could just celebrate, or somebody like Elton John could make us think about AIDS in ways we never had thought about each other before, it built a love among this broad group of people. And that helped add to what it took to get up in the morning, what it took to keep going. And that's why we're still here today after these 30 years. But keeping this movement peaceful was a whole nother thing. And I have to say that as a young person, and I was just a little bit younger than Carolyn, so I was like eight when we started. <laughs> but we gathered some of those old timers and um, had a little tiny baby. So like in January or February of 1980, and gathered them in Ames, old timers conference to hear, you know, kind of what had happened in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. And, you know, we were all kind of attracted to American Ag kicking up a big dust storm. What are we going to do here? What's this about? And one of the old timers who was, uh, I think, a former editor of the Farmers Union newspaper was up presenting. And he was an old timer and he said, listen, Land prices are starting to fall up here in northwestern Iowa, where it got really high. And a lot of guys that had come back from Vietnam had gotten in, but had to borrow, and you could feel it coming. And you know, he was saying, these farm prices going down, we're going to have trouble here. And people said, wow, farm prices going down, land going down, that, that's, that's a good thing. And he said, no, 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 you don't get it. These farm prices and these land prices start to fall, and they start these foreclosures, and we start a whole rolling out and an economic crisis. And he said, let me tell you something else. And then he was, he was preaching by this time, right? And he said, you know, if we're not there and we're not organizing to address people's real hurt, if we're not there to provide a real analysis of where this is coming from, and if we're not there to take real action, the right wing and the extremists and those people who will just go into a vacuum and scoop up people who are angry and who are frustrated and who've done all the right things and served their country in all kinds of ways, they'll scoop them up and they'll make a right-wing movement and that's what we're gonna have out of this farm crisis if we don't get going. And he kind of kicked our butts. He kicked our butts. And it took maybe six months before people gathered up in Merle Hansen's banker's basement down in Nebraska and said, you know, we better get these hotlines. Dorothy Lau was already doing a hotline just at home in Nebraska. We had to support them. We had to provide real services, not these phony things that the right was doing. 
We needed an analysis. We needed to stop talking about this being a farm crisis that just kind of either fell from God or kind of had my accent. No, this was a planned policy. We were going to create a farm crisis so this land would be transferred. And they said, get your analysis out there so people understand how this happened. And you better have real policies for real ideas to make real change because the right wings, the extremists, those extreme elements in our society where anger can be harnessed, can be turned into self-violence or self-medication or shooting the banker or taking it out on immigrants or whatever it might be. And it's in that education of this younger generation by that older generation who had seen movements become violent and had seen movements spin apart because they couldn't figure out about the love part and support part. So we were lucky. We had farm aid to come together and celebrate and we had ways to pass each other around and our kids could know each other and we could know each other's tragedies and we could know our lives together. We had ways to build the love together and we had older people willing to kick our butts and say, you better do your job because you'll open up a political opportunity for the extremist and that will be the end of the movement and the end of the farm, at least the family farm as we know it. We were lucky and we had farm aid to gather every year and we had farm aid support to keep on keeping on and we had the love that Willie and, you know, John and Neil, I mean, they expressed this in love and that gave us a way to know that it was okay for us to love each other. Thank you.